I want to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, we really appreciate it. We love having everyone join our programs. It just it really sparks the conversation and keeps everyone learning from each other. So today we are learning about, or hearing about rather, new audience data strategies. And this presentation is sponsored by Omida. Where the conversation happens is our fun hashtag that we would like for you to use on our social media, just so everyone can see that we are the best and share anything on there, what you've learned from these programs, anything you'd like to share, hashtag where the conversation happens. We do have some events coming up. So on April 7th, we have Reimagining B2B Marketing, April 29th, All About AI, and Mac Day on May 12th. Make sure you mark that on your calendar. I will finally be able to meet y'all in person. Be live and in person that day. Uh, info will be released uh, early next week, a little bit maybe today. Um, mm -hmm. So Mac Day is our first in-person event. It will be at the Hilton New York Airport, uh, Newark Airport, not New York, Newark airport and we're looking forward to seeing you all we have a great uh slate of panelists one of which is joining us today and uh it's going to be a fantastic event we're looking forward to seeing you all there so i think um and with jess without further ado i guess you want to take it from here yeah yeah just want to real quick just go over our social media um where the conversation happens again and a thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, thank you all. Without you, we can't do anything. Exactly. Without our sponsors, without our members, without our speakers, our the attendees here today, our wonderful board. Um, they really help push us forward, all of you. So we appreciate your support. And if you have not renewed, please do so soon. I'm going to stop my share here and hand it over to Lisa and thank everyone once again for joining us today. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us. It's gonna be an amazing conversation. Panel is an outstanding group of data, audience data specialists that I have known for quite a long time and I'm really proud to have speak today. It's a special day. Um, I wanna thank Dennis for leading it off and I wanna thank specifically Vesna, Tony, Rick, um, you guys are awesome and it's going to be a great presentation. So thank you. And um, I want to thank Omita for being our presenting sponsor today. This should be a real special event. So um, use the chat for questions. We'll break as needed. And I'm going to turn it over to Dennis, um, as I call him my favorite data dude. Take it over, Dennis. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks. And thanks, everybody, for your time and joining um, this is going to be a really great um, conversation, and I just want to share a little bit more about our panel uh, because uh, as I've had the opportunity to get to know them, um, they're, I've just learned how incredibly um, great they are, and there is so much to learn um, from, from this crew. So we do have today... Um, Vesna Moore, who is the Director of Audience Development for Annex Business Media. She manages uh, their consolidated audience database that has over 65 different brands that encompasses more than 30 industries and 300 business sectors, all leverage, uh, leveraging and using proprietary market research, profiling, and segmentation. And she's on the leading edge of technology. She's worked in large and small magazine publishing companies in both consumer and B2B sectors. So huge welcome to Vesna Moore. Thank you for being here. You are amazing. Um, we also have uh, the wonderful Rick Ellis with us. He is uh, the data protection officer and director of audience management at CFE Media and Technology. He manages their audience database of engineers and all associated publications, newsletters, events, and websites. Uh, he's exceptionally knowledgeable about the publishing industry, marketing, and business, and he's worked for many publishing companies, including Read Business Information. And finally, we also have Tony Napoleon. Tony is the VP of Client Experience at Omida. 
uh, the lead, industry's leading audience growth and engagement platform, offering subscription management, email, marketing, and CDP services to over 200 media companies and publishers. His role is leading client success, marketing, and the support teams, centering on driving client engagement with the Amida platform and community. Uh, prior to Amida, he did spend 10 years at Bobbitt Business Media, where he was the director of audience development and email marketing. So super incredible in-depth knowledge base um, from our panel today. Uh, I just really wanted to give them some kudos before we got started. Um, we're also going to have a ton of fun. So you're going to see some gifts today. Uh, it's Friday. So we're super excited uh, to talk about audience strategies and how we're changing the game. We're trying to be maybe unlike this dog, but going somewhere um, in the future. And here's kind of we're going to focus today really on, on five different buckets. So more of a deep dive into progressive profiling. We're going to talk about journeys and voyages, owning the topic, content gates, and then we're going to wrap it up with some other ideas, um, quick wins and other strategies, and then we're going to have a discussion. Um, so we are going to kind of go a little bit section by section. Um, the panelists have agreed to take questions kind of as we go. Um, but then we will have a larger Q&A at the end. So um, if you have sort of a topic specific question as we go along, please uh, raise your hand, put the question in the chat um, or just jump in. I'm gonna turn it over to Rick to talk about progressive profiling. Yes, yeah, so good to be with you all. Progressive profiling, I've got two stories to tell you. One is uh, it's got, uh, didn't turn out the way we wanted it to, and the other one is working very well. So, but that's how you, you learn, right? So the first one is the idea was to take telemarketing names and to get them in with very minimal information and a, a low cost per name and then set up a nice marketing automation series to collect all the other wonderful information that we want, right? Uh, to to, to bring, put the qualified back in qualified uh, subscriptions. So we started with uh, the, the pitch on the phone was basically, would you like some great content on our plant engineering market? Uh, you know, and we talk about the things that matter to our plant engineers. And for the low, low barrier of entry of basically your content information and an email, we would send you this great information. And then what we did is we wanted to set up a, a welcome series basically that would collect the information, thinking we could drive them and, and to, a, to a customize their form and, and customize their profile, and then um, finish it up by you know collecting, offering them up some of our products along the way, as well as some of our best products, and then send them a survey at the end of the, the 90 days to see how things are going. So that was the the plan and what we did is we set up a journey and, and Dennis if you could hit the next slide. So the idea was we start with a phone call and then we start with a journey that takes these folks through uh, the, the and I, this, I know this is a bit of an eye chart but the idea was that we take them through uh, the first email we would send them after their confirmation email was hey customize your content and we like to ask our by specify question first out of the gate and then we would take them through and the, the idea was, well, if they answered it, we're just going to say, great, you're good now. We're going to send you on an ebook to our ebooks and our CFE EDU training courses. And then 90 days later, send you a survey. And all would be one. And if they didn't answer that question, if they didn't give us their content and customize their content and ask the advice, answer the by specify question, that we would then send them a few nice things and two other reminders. And so uh, they both groups got the ebook library. Ebooks are very popular in our industry right now. And then we would send them a reminder that said, hey, you still need to set up your profile. Still, don't forget to customize your experience. Wait a little bit of time and then send them another thing. We've got, again, great training courses. I didn't want to just hit them, bam, 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 with you know, three emails of, hey, don't forget, don't forget. The last reminder, though, that last one on that list, reminder two, was fairly strong. Hey, we really need you to do this. And so what we learned here, folks, is when you're talking to somebody on the phone, get that information. <laughs> Uh, because what we've determined is as much as I wanted to think that I could get an email only or very close to it, and then that these folks would joyfully fill out these forms later and, and, and give this information. I mean, we all know 
you know, the telemarketing names are kind of tough to engage. And it did, this, this um, voyage did work to engage these people. We got decent open rates, but very few people, less than 20% of the people that I acquired with email only filled out that form. The rest were happy to ignore it and just keep getting our digital editions and things like that. So what I would say that we learned here is, while it did work to engage these folks, and that, that I would always recommend with telemarketing, you know, get them in as soon as you can and engage them with your best stuff. Yeah, getting get that information while you got them on the phone. Just get it, it at least get the, you know, short forms are always good, short scripts are always good. But for us, the buy specified question really directs us on where to go, uh, what we can offer these folks. So that's the lesson learned. Get it because you're going to have less than 20% or so that, at least in our experience, and plant engineers are tough, engineers in general are a tough audience, but that's what we learned with this particular progressive profile. Now we're going to try some other stuff. Don't get me wrong, but it's going to be on the website. And I've got another example that we used. So this one is, is much more straightforward and this is working very well. So we have a pop-up that is very related to the, uh, the topic they are looking at at the time. So this is our brand consulting specifying engineer. If you start to read, we, we've got a number, probably like you all, we've got a host of newsletters that are very topic specific. And so what we do is if you're reading an article on um, HVAC or something very related to it, you'll see this pop up if you're, if you're not already in our system. And the idea was we wanted to get these folks in and you know it, the, we'd have a better success rate. And we proved that we did have a better success rate when you've got something that's very targeted to what they're already, already reading. So, you know, you were getting a typical response rate here of honestly one to 2% on the high side. But I'll take that as a pop, not terrible, at least in my experience. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to take it to the next level. And it's fine. I, what I didn't want is a bunch of names with just an email and a country in my database, if I could help it. And so what we tried is now um, when you fill out this form, you get, you hit submit and you're taken to the next form. So this form opens up and it says, great, that's done. Now you can customize your experience. And we pre-populate this information, by the way. We, you know, we, we put their, uh, uh, their, their name in here if we have it. And email's not shown on this one, but if we pre-populate that in some versions. And then we ask one question, our most in, uh, important question. And this is a progressive form. So if by some reason they've filled out some other information, the next question will appear. But by specify for us, again, is our directional question. So we ask them this question, and what you can't see below it is all of the other newsletters. So you answer the one, you go to this form. So you sign up for the HVAC solutions. Great, that's done. Then you come to this form. We ask you that one more data point. And what we find is that people are signing up for seven to 10 other newsletters on this next form. So that is an amazing, I mean, I'm not surprised by it necessarily because, you know, you, the more things you give them to sign up for, the more they're going to sign up for. But at the same time, the, the thing that is really impressive about this is the abandon rate is super low. We're finding that 60 to 75% of the people that hit the second form complete that form. To me, that is dynamite. That, that, it, it, it was actually much higher than I expected. Uh, but they're engaged, they're in the moment, and it's worked very well. So that's what we've done here. We're going to start, you know, keep tweaking it. But this has been working very well. We've, been rolled, we've rolled this out on all of our brands. And it's, like I said, it's working very well. So those are the two examples I wanted to show you. A, a, a kind of a little bit of a sad story and a little bit of a happy ending here on my profile. Yeah, super, really interesting stories, Rick. I can't believe you're getting people to sign up for seven newsletters. It just it has me curious, are people staying engaged? Um, on, on that many newsletters after they sign up? Are, are they getting excited here and then staying engaged? So it's a great question, Dennis. So for the, I, I think the, the long answer is yes, but it really depends. We've got some dynamite newsletters and then we've got some that come out every other month. And so I don't have a great read, as great a read on them. This particular audience, consultant specifying engineer, is an, a highly engaged audience. Unlike our plant engineering guys, who these are guys running around a plant. The plant engineering guys are not as desktop. So they tend to be less engaged than our consulting specifying engineers. And I think sometimes you see that with people that are more running around. What's interesting is that our plant engineers, when they're on our site, they're engaged, they're clicking on more articles than our other brands. But the tough part is to get them to open something to come to the website. 
So, it, you know, I, I look at it that way. But to answer your question more directly, in this brand, very engaged. And I think they typically act like our website acquisition name. So they're more engaged than, than most, if you will. Excellent. Wow. Really good story. Really good story. Do we have any, any immediate questions for Rick on progressive profiling? I do want to say though, Rick, that I'm, I'm totally there with you on, on get the information while they're engaged because trying to go back on any kind of conversions or anything like that is always tough. So if you've got a captive audience, use it when you have it for sure. Absolutely. And we are going to try one other thing where we're going to start targeting these folks with um, a inline uh, question after they come back and see if we can get more information. But yeah. I'm, I'm a little That'd pessimistic now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we're going to give it a go. We're going to give it a go. Yeah. So. Good. Good for a round two. Um, do, you, do you include? This meeting is being recorded. Thanks. Uh, do you include on more than one demo question on this progressive filing, or is you just limited to that one primary one that's the specifying or the, the question that you've got listed in the sample? Yeah, Jim, it's the by specify question, and we do just limit it to one. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, one question because it's still kind of, especially on the other brands, it's a little bit of a longer question, and that list of newsletters is long. So I only wanted the one question up there. But, you know, it's important when you're doing this, if you're going to go with the short form you guys all know this but get the one that means the most get that first get the one that matters the most and for us this is a very directional question this is going to tell us what to promote them on all the other events and all of the webcasts and all the other things we do if we have this answer it's basically the what do you like question cool good question Jim. All right, let's jump to journeys and voyages. All right, so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about journeys and voyages and a couple of things that we've been doing at Annex Business Media using journeys and implementing journeys and kind of the, um, the responses that we've had from our, our clients and our customers. So that little guy trying to get out of that box, it's intended to signify, you know, thinking outside the box and kind of how we get a little beat up when we try to do that sometimes. But Every now and then an idea can come together and uh, we've had uh, some, some good success with um, what we've done with our lead driver and our, our ad driver program so far. Lead driver, if you can go to the next one and one more there, Dennis, is basically where we've set up a templated um, but flexible journey for our clients. So this is where our clients can come to us and we've already prepackaged a journey for their prospects, their potential clients. Um, and that journey includes um, multi-channel voyage. It's highly targeted. Um, we create a gated landing page for the client um, so that we're collecting any of those leads that are unknown to our database. We have pop-ups on our site that are trying to engage people with their advertising. We also have a four drip email campaign that we do. And the drip campaign actually does exactly that. It drips so it goes from the whole audience to people who opened and people who clicked and then really targeting and narrowing down those leads for that client. We include a Facebook social campaign as well. Um, and we also include what we call our sponsored spotlights, which is um, an area on our newsletters. And then at the end of this campaign, one of the biggest things is that we're providing a scored lead list back to the client. So Think about it like a, a large package sort of um, campaign that goes to all these different tactics, all these different channels, and then every click, every engagement on that client's campaign within the lead driver campaign will be tracked and be scored. So at the end of the day, we're going to be providing them, if we give them 300 leads, they'll know the top 25 and they'll know where to concentrate and you know how much engagement each of those leads actually had. So you know, one more, Dennis. So similar to what Rick had showed earlier, this is the, the voyage. Um, it's a sample voyage. We didn't wanna give away the secret sauce of what our voyage is, but this is a visual representation of the different tactics that are involved in a lead driver campaign. The concept is that we are going out, we're not just doing branding, but we're also creating highly engaged leads using a number of the different tactics that we have available to us. So it's proven that it's been kind of 
easy for people to understand. And especially if you're going to clients that are not necessarily using agencies, they don't understand voyages, they don't understand, you know, um, drip campaigns and things like that. So you're making it easy for them to really buy into a, a highly flexible, but highly usable template for their marketing and their campaigns. And at the end of the day, be able to provide a lot of really good leads that are targeted to people who have seen their branding through the campaign process. I, I love this. I mean, this is great. The multi-channel effect, the, the scored leads going back to people. And one of the things that I, I know I see a lot, Vesna, is the, the customers more and more, they want you to do it all. They, 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 they are busy. Good luck getting them on the phone. They love seeing these things because you're doing the marketing. And many of them ha are struggling to keep their marketing automation the hub spots and the market is going so this yeah is, absolutely this is really and, and as publishing companies you know we've we've for many years we've been talking about you know do we act as an agency on behalf of our clients do right. we look at ourselves as an agency and this is one of those ways where um you know we've had we've had some success both from client direct taking these lead driver programs and we've had a couple of agencies come to us too and both love it because of the ease Basically, what we're asking the client to do is provide all the content, tell us what they want in every element of the content. Once we have that content available, we ask for, you know, seven days to do the setup, get the templates in place and get the whole thing going. And it usually runs for about a month um, <clears throat> in order to get all the social stuff in. And one of the nice things, too, is it's using our audiences, which should be their customer base, um, but it's also collecting are unknown people as well and providing those direct clients. So if someone's coming in from social campaigns or from you know um, anything else from the landing pages that we create for them, um, there's a gate that applies and we ask them for their, their core information so that when we pass those leads along, we have as much information as we can. Um, and it's, it's been working very well. We actually have four on the go currently right now. Um, and our, our sales team is really embracing this and really kind of getting out the gate with it. Yeah, this is super, super cool. I love too how you're like providing the score because once once you send leads back to clients, sometimes they get overwhelmed in terms of where do I start and is this a hot lead or a cold lead or a warm lead? Yeah, exactly. Um, it gives, it, they can concentrate on the best leads first. Yeah. Can you, are you willing to talk a little bit about your lead scoring? So people are asking about it and, and that could be secret sauce as well, but can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, right now what we've done for the lead scoring is we've taken a look at how much engagement has been in the campaign. Um, we're with Omida and we're using their, their Odyssey platform to do this. And right now there isn't a way to do a score directly on an Odyssey campaign. It's something that I'll be uh, you know, hoping to talk about a little bit at the, at the OX5 session next month. Um, but right now what we're doing is we're kind of almost manually going through and seeing, okay, they clicked on email one, they also clicked on email two, they also clicked on the personalization. So we're looking at the total engagement on the campaign itself, and then giving a basic score of high, medium, and low. Now, going forward with the introduction of some of the lead scoring capabilities on Omida's platform, we're going to hope to be able to tie in that true, you know, value score of, you know, you get five points for this, 10 points for that, 20 points for that, within the campaign and be able to give them just a, a, a number that they can use to, to determine their own version and threshold of high leads and, and low leads. I, uh, lead scoring is something I think we all like to play around with. I've, I've played around with it a little bit and usually is basically an engagement measurement on our side. Um, you know, how, how many have they opened? Did they download this white paper on that same topic or what have you? And the score goes up accordingly, but we found it sometimes tough to monetize those to get extra for those names sometimes. The other thing we've done is um, plan to buy stuff, right? Are you gonna buy this product for the next you know, 10, 12 months or whatever? But that gets, you don't get a giant response on that, you know, because then they, it, it's tougher to get into that. Very interesting. Yeah, Rick, you bring up a good point on the lead scoring side of things. So obviously as Omida, we have a lead scoring tool, all that kind of stuff. And yes, we certainly encourage clients to like put together you know, gold, silver, bronze, whatever it is with some of this stuff, and certainly encourage uh, selling those high level people at uh, higher CPMs. Obviously, it can be a little bit harder. We're going to talk a little bit more about like revenue and monetization later on, but we're also seeing it as an opportunity to um, essentially protect 
some of your best subscribers from some of the more generic stuff that goes on. So fine, maybe you can't charge an extra hundred bucks per thousand for your gold people, but maybe you can prevent, you can suppress them from getting some of the more like run of the mill house ads or something like that, because you want to make sure these folks know every time they're getting an email from you, it's like really important to them, that sort of thing. So we see it both from a revenue opportunity as well as we're going to talk about some of the engagement stuff too. It's, it's a great chance to, uh, to protect some of your quote unquote best customers as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's really, really good insight. All right. Uh, I think one, one more question for just Fesna with the, the low, medium, high. Um, so do you, do you find that it's, I love the concept. Actually, it's a little better to me than trying to determine the granularity level of the points, like trying to say, okay, this is 50 points, 80 points, 100 points. But so it kind of gives us almost like, again, three buckets which one do they go in it's a little easier to determine yes they go in the middle bucket put them in the middle bucket um so but do you have a do you have like sort of a thought process where you go on a brand by brand basis like one brand or maybe one market is considered small or low bucket if it's at level x and then another market is level it, maybe that's not as the same threshold is that how you determine the low medium high or or do you yeah. give it the same, same level for everyone well, we started thinking that it would be the same level for everyone, but honestly, what we have found is every time we finish one of these lead driver campaigns and we go to do that assessment of the values of the scores on that uh, lead file that we provide back to the client, we're finding depending on the market, we may evaluate it differently. So it is a little bit of eyeballing involved, honestly, until we kind of go through a couple of these. And of course, like anything, it, it's based on, the success is based on the content to a large degree as well. So we can have the exact same program run for two different clients and you know, to the same audience and everything. And performance is very different dependent on the content that is being offered from the client. So there's a lot of variables in there and you do have to really kind of do an assessment each time you're getting through one of these. So, but so yes, it, it, it can change based on the industry, based on the client, based on the content and everything. That's okay, not, thank you. I got one more for you too, Desna. The, yeah. the, the duration of this campaign. Yeah. It, can you talk a little bit about that? Is this a 30 day campaign? Is this a what? Yeah, it, it's set to be a monthly campaign. Um, and the reason is that that seemed to be a, a easy sort of timeline to, to wrap our heads around as far as the client's timeline and everything too. They know what to expect. But it was also in an effort to try and give the amount of time in between each of the drip campaigns and then to try and give enough time for the personalization to really take effect, um, as well as when that newsletter is going out with the ad and when the social is going out. Um, you could probably wrap it up within three weeks, um, but it just seemed like a, an easier thing to say that it was a monthly campaign. The personalization sits on there for personalization, which is our, our pop-up modals, sit on the, the website or the websites uh, for one month. Seems to be working well. Really, really good stuff. And this is just a, a kind of a promo piece that talks to our, our clients when we're trying to, to get a sale on the lead driver program and it talks about all of the values and the benefits of you know how how it works and uh, what they can expect and what the intent is of a lead driver campaign so our, our COO actually worked very hard on getting a lot of this content he comes from an editorial background um, so he was actually instrumental in getting this launched and up and running and, and everything so it was it was a win-win all the way through from a from every aspect. So we're hoping to see a lot of success with this program. It's basically white labeling an Odyssey journey um, through our, our platform provider, which is giving us a brand new product to sell, which has been selling quite well so far. This is great, really powerful stuff. And then with, at the same time that we were kind of looking at lead driver, um, we kind of came up with the concept of ad driver as well, which is very similar. It uses Odyssey in the same way. We've simplified it because it, we just, you know, we don't need as much as, as a full lead driver program. But the concept here is this is going to be something that we run on a regular basis that actually benefits our own sales team. So it's pretty much, you know, creating a, a marketing division within the audience department 
to be able to market our upcoming issues to our Salesforce list, to our, our client, to our salespeople's clients list. So the premise here is that we create an odyssey that will send three emails uh, letting people know about the uh, content and the editorial content of the next issue and that they should be advertising. So we're basically marketing our own brands. We, you know, we sell our products to our clients and we tell them how wonderful it works. And we thought we'd, we'd do the same thing, basically use ourselves like a client would use us to sell our own magazines. Um, and so what we do is we've taken a look at our Salesforce lists uh, across all of our different brands and we've built data models um, to give us an insight into who are the advertisers for each of our brands currently. And we've used those to build lookalikes. We then take the lookalikes that we use by taking a look at the NAICS codes, the job titles, the company size, and any other demographic information that we could have assessed. We get that information by doing a merge purge across our entire database um, and appending NAICS codes, job title codes, employee size codes, and then running that data model, getting those lookalikes, and then what we can do is we can run this ad driver campaign to those lookalikes as well as the Salesforce list. So people are going to be getting emails from us saying, hey, the next issue is coming up in three weeks. It's all about, you know, uh, lubricants and ball bearings. And as a lubricant and ball bearing company, you should be advertising in the next issue. So we then turn around and we get people to go to our, you know, advertise page. And we also provide those people that click on those to as leads to the salespeople directly to follow up. Um, and so far, we've gotten some, some great sort of responses from the sales folks getting those leads and being able to reach out to brand new people that, you know, they don't have on their Salesforce list. And it's been working out fine. So go to the next slide, Dennis. So the one thing to remember, especially when you're building those lookalike leads, is that Profiling is awesome and it works very well, but you have to do the due diligence of looking at the data that you're building when you're building lookalikes. People can look very similar on paper, just like Prince Charles and Ozzy Osbourne here, to very different people. So we actually went through, took a look at the models brand by brand and took a look at the company names in those models to see that, you know, the people that we're going to be sending these, these marketing pieces to are the appropriate people based on who they are and what they do. So um, again, we just started that probably around July, August of last year. Uh, we started with a few magazines, just piloted the process. And now the audience department is running these marketing promotional pieces um, for every single issue that we do. So we're talking thousands and thousands a year, but it's been worthwhile and we'll see how it all kind of works out by the end of this fiscal. Hopefully we'll have had some, some new revenue um, that we can attribute to this program. So wow. all within your own database, uh, Lesna, the, 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 the your, your uh, Salesforce databases, that was all no external sources to get those, all your own internal prospects you already have. Yeah, so far it's been our own internal database. Um, so we've been, you know, merge person the Salesforce with our audience database. A lot of them have come on as comps or they've come on as readers and we've had enough um, of a match rate to be able to create the profiles and do the models. Having said that, if we're finding that we're getting some good success, especially if we're finding that these new names, these prospect names are, are, are coming in and are interested and are engaged, we might look at perhaps acquiring similar kinds of names outside of our own database. Yeah, I was just I was just going to say, just looking at this slide, like it looks so simple, but I'm, I can't even imagine the amount of data work and the rules that goes into this, like clearly, clearly sophisticated. And, and you guys have built like a really amazing process to get this done. Yeah, I mean, we try to keep it as simple as we can. Um, but like I said, I think the, the devil is always in the details. And um, especially when you're building those those lookalikes is making sure that you're, you're getting that targeting appropriately or else you're going to just not get any engagement and you're going to get you know, people reaching out to salespeople saying, why are you sending me this? And it makes no sense kind of thing. So um, yeah, it's worth the work. Are, are the lookalikes feeding to salespeople as well? Absolutely, yeah. They, they go on as, uh, as leads to the salespeople if any of the lookalikes click. Excellent. All right, let's talk about own the topic. 
Yeah, so this is uh, this is a, an idea that we came up a couple of years ago and implemented um, over the last the course of the last year and a half or so, and it's been extremely successful for us. So the concept was, you know, all of our uh, websites are broken down by taxonomies and groups and topics, and the what we wanted to pitch was an easy way for a uh, one of our customers to own the entire topic, to 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 be omnipresent on that one area of our website. And we wanted to put in some things, a uh, lead gen package into it as well. And we wanted to get monthly revenue. We wanted people to pay us for monthly, you know, uh, being on our site uh, in multiple packages. So uh, with this particular package, and I'll show you an example of it, you can own a particular taxonomy, as I mentioned. In this case, the, uh, I'm going to show you an electrical package. And with that, you get all of the ads on the site. And then, you know, screen shares, sorry, but you can only see one, but there's four ads on every page basically. And so they've got different ads or in some cases the same ads or very derivatives of it in four different spots on this article and any articles that are tagged as electrical in this case. And then about five seconds in, a pop-up shows up that is their pop-up, their creative. Sometimes we'll build it for them, but it's a lead driver, right? So in this case, it's download the white paper. Sometimes they go to their site. I prefer when they go through our Dragon Forms, but either way, um, it's a lead gen device. And then along with this, we sell a newsletter to a smaller engaged audience, usually 10 to 15,000 people that meet this criteria. And so they get what's kind of disguised as a, as a newsletter. It's got its content rich, it's sponsored, and it's also got a, a lead gen device on it. The idea, again, is to just leverage that information we have on these folks. And it's been extremely successful. We, we've been selling out of this product to the point where we're starting to split up our topics and come up with what the sales force says is hybrid topics, but they're really slices of another topic. And so it's, it's created a good problem with us of us having, you know, we used to have like um, digital transformations, a big deal in our industry, right? And it's kind of a nebulous word, but now we're slicing that into, oh, well, there's the sensors part of it, or there's the clouds part of it or whatever. And we're saying, all right, well, we used to deliver this package that would deliver X many of impressions every month and X many leads and X, you know, the, the newsletters and, and all of the, 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 um, uh, the clicks and all of that data. And now what we're saying is, all right, we're going to, we've increased the price and we're starting to segment it and say, all right, well, for this slice of it, you know, this, this topic electrical is now two different topics. Maybe it's electrical safety and electrical distribution. And so we're starting to actually get to the point where we need to slice those up because it's such a powerful package. And people love it too. Just even the terminology of own this topic, own this taxonomy on the website, it's been a very potent sales message for us. And we've been able to, I mean, it's, it's definitely been high six figure revenues for us. So this has worked out extremely well. It does generate leads. It's kind of the total package. And um, as I said, our, 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 our next iteration of it, of it has been, if we started off with, I think it was 11 to, 15, I think actually, I think it was 15 topics. Our iteration of it is now going to be to slice that into 30, basically 30. It's actually going to, going to be more than 30 in some cases and raise the price. So it's, it's worked out extremely well. It is tough to manage a little bit on the back end because on the, on the back end, we do need to jockey between the priorities of, of this. And I see the question from Joyce. Uh, the time period for this campaign, Joyce, is we sell it in three, six, nine, and 12-month packages. So, um, but uh, we want that monthly revenue. I don't know about you guys, but we want to, we'd love to get to where our customers are just writing us a check every month. Yeah, and, and then we deliver them. And to, like, I love that thing that Vesna showed up here. We're trying to build more marketing automation type things where, you, would you just give us a check every month? We're going to do all these things for you. We're going to do these 10 things for you in that month. And then we're going to just deliver you a nice report at the end of the month. And a pack of, here's a bunch of leads and, and all of that. So anyway, the on the topic, it's, it leverages the taxonomy data on your own website, leverages the, the Omita, the analytics system and everything that's embedded in our, on our system. And, and it's, it's really been a, a, a very good thing for us, uh, a good revenue generator. Yeah, well, and the incentive, that. Rick, for uh, your people to uh, commit to longer packages with some of this stuff is because there are going to be different people coming in on a recurring basis, right? You're not you're not just talking to the same people for three or uh, months versus twelve months. Uh, agreed. Vesna, you were. 
Yeah, I was just gonna say, I, I mean, I love the idea. I, I mean, I brought up a, a similar sort of concept a, a couple of months back to, to my boss and to some of our salespeople just to see what they thought of it. And it was also including the ability to use that same taxonomy for you know electrical systems like you have here and offer them a package where they can take an annual subscription at a, you know, a decent price. Um, and we would not only place their ads where the content is relevant to that topic, but we would also do e-blasts to people, the last, you know, people that engage with that specific topic and uh, provide that as a package. Is that something we're going to be kind of looking at, fleshing out a little bit and seeing if that's something that could work for us as well? But I, I, I think it's terrific. And through the magic of the data science, I just figured out well, a little bit ago now, but I just figured out that I know who saw these ads. Yeah. I know who saw them. So I can go and target those people, both not like I can find them, it, it, you know, the people, both the knowns and the anonymous. And Jim, I saw your question and you're exactly right. We, we've grown our services team in part because of this. We're also having some success with the services and the marketing. But yeah, it's, it probably is closer to 2X than I would like to admit, but it's, it's definitely my audience team and, and our services team spend a lot of time on this particular product. It, it definitely is, it doesn't run itself per se, uh, but it's it's also not, you know, building the wall of China as well. It's, it's, it's the, the tools are all there and at our fingertips and building HTMLs and, you know, all of this stuff as well, the lead gen uh, tools in the Omega system and all of that. So it's, 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 it's been good, but yeah, as it, as it goes up to 30, uh, myself and our director of operations is responsible for the website. One of the things I should mention here is run a site ad, right? You got to be careful that you're not stomping all over them. And that's been an internal challenge. So we are working on that as well. And internally, we would love to just do this and not even have the other ads. Like we would just like to say, nope, we don't have any more run of site ads, but it's not us. So it's it's internal discussions, but this thing has been so successful. And again, that, that monthly hey, just three months worth, we'll take it from here, guys, so. And do you, Rick, does your team own the taxonomy and is controlling the next iteration? Because I imagine you're getting requests for like hyper-specific topics that might not be like co coverable, if that makes so is there kind of like a backlog wish list or how do, how do you kind of manage like where to start on the taxonomy stuff and, and maintain like continuity to sales? Yeah, it is a really interesting question, Dennis, because we, I, I share the responsibility with our director of operations who's responsible for the website. And so I've got the audience data part of it and he's got the number of impressions and the ad set up and all of that stuff over there. And between the two of us, we watch it very carefully. And, you know, what you find out is that you've got this one topic that is, you know, let's just say 100,000 impressions in a month. When you split it into these two high, more specific topics, guess what? One is 70 and the other is 30. And so how do you make those promises and how do you deliver? And so those are some of the challenges that we're working on. And we're doing that in some cases with uh, managing expectations and just saying, look, this is what you're going to get. It's going to be great. And, and telling the customer, just so you know, you're going to be getting, this is more like X number of impressions, but hitting those numbers is, it, it, it does take a lot of babysitting and watching. And even in some cases, we can adjust the priority of all of this stuff in the background of what things will show up in our WordPress uh, instance. And so there are, when it's, when there are a lot of these running in, in March, we fired up, I think we got 10 running in the month of March. That is a lot of levers being pulled almost weekly to, and measurement of how's that coming? Uh, you know, oh, this one is struggling. Let's do. Do they care? Or, you know, some advertisers pay super close attention. Others, eh, as long as they're getting their emails out, it, it's not a big deal. But you know, you, as usual, the bigger customers tend to be more demanding, and, and and so so that is an ongoing thing. And it kind of speaks to Jim's point of even though the the nuts and bolts of it are relatively resource agnostic, for lack of a better word, but the monitoring has been an ongoing thing. And that's me and my buddy on the operations side that we, we're, we're meeting at least once a week on this stuff. So anyway, it's been, it, it's, it, it does take management. And, it's, it's a, and the other thing, the last thing I'll say is try, what we want to get to is to be able, when they come up with the topic, I want to be able to say, yeah, that's 30,000 impressions. Or that's what you're going to get. And that is proving a little trickier. Some it's easy, but some of them are really tricky when you get into those hyper-specific ones, as you mentioned. 
good insight. Wow, super good story. All right, let's shift to gated content. All right, so content gates. Um, this is a good example of taking a look at what your systems and your applications can do for you and just giving it a try. Um, we never took the initiative to decide that we wanted to impose content gates on any of our websites or anything else like that. Um, but we knew we had the ability with our new platform to be able to do it. So we thought, okay, last summer we, we said, let's test one. We're gonna take one magazine and we're gonna watch it very closely and uh, see how it all goes. And it ended up as a huge success story. So it, it, it taught us things. It taught us that it's okay to content gate. It taught us that it's okay to ask for a little bit of information from people who are visiting your website that are not subscribed to your products. Um, it's okay to make it easy to keep them coming back. Even though what we've implemented was technically a hard gate, um, we've done it in such a way that people will eventually get access back in to receive, to get the content again and again. Um, and we realize it's okay to grow our email list uh, for zero marketing dollars. Um, and that it's okay to get better engagement because the people that we're getting through this content gate are proving to be better engaged um, than, than expected. So we, we, we learned the, the easy way on this one as opposed to the hard way where often you know, lessons are learned. So we're now looking back at this amazingly successful sort of process. And we are right now the month of March rolling out to our other 64 titles, other 64 websites with these content gates. So if you can go to the next slide, Dennis. Yeah. So the magazine we tested for was OHS Canada. And this is uh, an example of what the, the content gate looks like. Um, and it targets our non-subscribing visitors only, not necessarily unknown. So you can be um, known to even from a different product, but you can be known to us on our website but you're not subscribed. So the value, I'm not getting the value from a subscription from you. So it targets anybody that's a non-subscriber. We're allowing three free articles to these people. Um, and then the hard gate presents after that. Uh, so the, when they subscribe, they no longer see the gate, obviously. It, it, and it resets every 30 days. And I think the secret to the success is that reset every 30 days because the biggest concern with imposing any kind of gate, whether it's a content gate or a paid gate or anything like that, is you're going to see a huge dip in your traffic. People will just stop coming. They're not going to go past that. Um, so we spent the first six months watching this one magazine very, very closely uh, with weekly reports sent to the publisher um, that we, we looked at every single Friday to ensure that we weren't going to see any detrimental hit on the traffic on the other side. And we didn't see any, we saw no negative impact on the traffic. If anything, we saw in many instances where the traffic was slightly higher than the average. Um, so we started the pilot back in July of 2021. We have since increased our total email list size, our newsletter list size by 30%. So we went from, uh, you know, about just 10, just over 10,000 on this one magazine um, to 13,800 so far. So, this is a horizontal sort of magazine that kind of affects a lot of our different industries. So it, it's always a good one to test on for us. It gives us that sort of regular sort of approach to, to the analysis and everything. So with the rollout, we're hoping to see similar effects on other magazines. Um, we saw a 777% increase of acquisition to our newsletters over our pop-ups. So that was huge. Um, you know, we've, we've really, really, enjoyed seeing these numbers kind of come through. Um, and at the same time, when we looked at the engagement specifically targeted to those people that came in through these gates, um, their engagement is 17% higher than our average. So not only are they, you know, providing us their, their email and their name and their country, they're also, you know, engaging and coming back, which makes sense. I was a little surprised when I first saw that, but then I thought, well, no, that makes total sense because these are people who've come to our website again and again, wanting to consume our content. So these are people who are actively consuming the content already. Um, and now we have them as readers and they're continuing to consume the content even more. So it was a real win-win situation. Um, and the interesting thing too, is when we're looking at how the gates themselves performed, 36% of the people that came in, almost 37% um, gave us their information on that very first gate. 
Um, and then the second gate and the third gate, much smaller, but you need them there in order to get to that final gate, which then brought 43 and a half percent of the people that subscribe to the newsletter through the gates. So um, we are literally launching about three websites a day for the month of March. <laughs> and then we'll uh, hopefully, we're hoping to grow our, our email database. And, and we're in Canada where we have the strictest um, anti-spam policy and it's full consent driven um, here in Canada for any kind of email acquisition. So we have a really hard time for email prospecting and email um, purchasing. We just can't do it. So having a tool like this is, is phenomenal on our, on our email growth. And we're hoping to see a lot of similar trends with the magazines that we're going to be launching with this, this, this month. I, I love this and it's scary. And I've got more questions that I will ask you later because I'd love to talk to you about this further. And I don't want to take up all of the time here, but I do have one simple question. How did you decide on the, the three articles? Uh, how did we decide on what, sorry? Yeah, you, you, or the, the, I think you said it was three articles was the limit for the month. How did yeah. you decide that? You know, we, we kind of thought three is good. We took a look at what our standard sort of um, traffic was. So when we sent our newsletters on average, how many times do, are people clicking on it to try and get a gauge of if we have similar sort of process happening with unknown readers, how many times can we expect that they might be kind of coming back without actually receiving our newsletter? Um, so we, we settled on three for this magazine. We're going with three for the other brands as well, just because it's the only sort of gauge we have right now, and it seems to be working well. Um, so it was, it was a bit of a, a guesstimate on that, but it, it worked very well. So we, we guessed right, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. I saw that as well. Really good. And, and um, so just, I'm, I'm kind of curious, Vesna, on the, on the content reset. So is it three views and then the hard wall? And then 30 days later, it's three more views and a hard wall? Yeah, I actually think, and maybe Tony, you'd know, um, with the gates, I think it's from the last click. So, um, you know, it would be when that hard gate presents. So if you, you know, you come in on the, the first of, January and you get an article, then you come in on the 15th, then you come in on the 20th, then you come in on the 31st of January, it will reset as of, you know, February 28th kind of thing. Yeah, we have some clients who do it on, on like a rolling 30 day period. And we have others who just say, okay, it resets for everybody on the first of the month, because it lets them clean up some of the language saying, hey, you're out of articles for February, as opposed to March. So either way. Yeah, yeah so we're using the, the rolling one. Are the, are the gates three different gates that you've got there or are like a... The, the, technically, it's one gate with three different messages that comes up. So you will see if you if you come in on your first article, say, um, you know, you, this is your first of three free articles. Ah, thank you. And on the second one, it says this is your second. And then your third one says this is your last free article. Um, and then the fourth one says you have no more articles. Please subscribe to, to get access. I know we're I know we're running a little bit up on time, but we always have a few minutes to go over. Um, but I, you know, wanted to give Tony an opportunity here to talk about other ideas. Thank you. You know, I, I appreciate that, uh, Dennis. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll skip a lot of these. Obviously, I mean, I, I think we could spend a lot of time talking about each one of these individually. Um, but you know, I'd, I'd much rather hear from Vesna and Rick on some of this stuff. So. Um, you know, a couple other options we want to introduce and or like reinforce some of these things admittedly are a little one on one. Um, uh, the thing I always like to re uh, reinforce is they not only work for your own audience growth and engagement initiatives, but they can also work as uh, as a saleable option. Right. These, these are sales and, and revenue options like Rick was talking about with, with some of this stuff. So um, I'll, I'll skip some of these. I, I think uh, on site modals honestly get overlooked uh, in a lot of cases. Um, you, you saw some of these from Rick. Certainly great source of first party data. Um, we really see it as a nice opportunity to convert unknown users to known and connecting that cookie to the individual user. Again, more and more popular um, and relevant as these third party cookies continue to you know, get closer to the, the latest end date from Chrome and some of the other ones. Opportunities for progressive profiling, Rick walked through all, through all of those, but these are sellable too. So it's not just, hey, like pop up and give me your, your uh, email address for our newsletter. 
targeting certain people with a message on behalf of advertisers is, is really popular with a lot of these two and can kind of come in somewhere between a full on pre stitchal interstitial page takeover versus like a one off e promo. So it's kind of a nice like lighter way with some of these, particularly if you're using things like um, like a scroll trigger uh, or a time delay or an exit intent something like that, where it's not necessarily right in your face or you're waiting until it's on their second page view or their third page viewer or something again. So it's it's not quite so so immediate with this. And you're using that uh, that demographic or behavioral data to only target the right page, uh, the right way. Talked about content gating, that's really great. The only piece I'll add here, um, we see results like what Vesna outlined. The only interesting, uh, the only other interesting piece is that that last piece, that final hard gate, we've had clients who set it up to say, this is your last one, but it's not actually a hard gate. They let them continue on, but they still see the same high conversion numbers on that final one, because people really do think like they're about to get shut off with something like that. So we had a client very concerned about losing those overall page views. So they still ran the same language, fourth one or fifth one came and they, they let people move on, but still saw a really good number. Um, uh, again, sponsorship opportunities, you know, okay. Five free page views in the month of February are brought to you by by Ford. You know, to to thank them for this free content, please click here. Something like that. Some additional inventory. Again, you're not running it for the whole site. You're running it for some uh, some smaller groups. We do see a lot of clients who uh, hesitate to set these up. I think there's a lot of apprehension um, around. And Nicole and Laura, who run our client success team, are here on the call too. I know, I know they run into a lot of just general um, timidness on some of this stuff because it seems like a very significant change to your web strategy, your content strategy, but there are some opportunities to do it in, in a lighter way. Um, we'll skip some of this other piece. Um, I'll, I'll say on the, um, on the re-engagement side of things, watching for different signals um, such as, okay, who is opening versus clicking, who's uh, uh, reacting to product A versus product B, whether it's newsletters or event promos, um, those always come into play um, and should be looked at for different uh, timeframes around uh, opens and clicks. So as you go to launch a re-engagement campaign, you want to look at a variety of different factors to figure out who should be brought in. I think kind of going with the onboarding piece of this, uh, it's a good chance to, to establish some of those cadences and realize earlier on in the process, who's falling off, who are you losing? Don't wait for that brand new name to lapse six months of unengaged or three months of unengaged before you start to re-engage them. We have some clients who start looking at engagement for net new names within seven days of them signing up because they're like, hey, within a week, we already know like who is going to be, uh, you know, if you, they sign up, you send them three newsletters that first week, they don't open any of them. Like you already kind of know how this relationship is going to go. So why not start jumping in a lot earlier via some of that automation, because otherwise it's hurting your inbox placement, it's hurting your overall deliverability, et cetera. And then you can launch some really good multi-channel. Jimmy had that good question before in the chat. We look at all this stuff from a multi-channel point of view. If you got an email address on there, they're getting your newsletter, they're not opening the newsletter, stop sending them emails saying, are you sure you don't want our newsletter? Like start hitting them with some of these pop-ups, push those groups into social. There are lots of other ways, frankly, in some cases, inexpensive ways to get in front of these people to, to quote unquote, win them back. Um, and on the monetization side, I think, you know, both Vesna and Rick walked through some really nice options here. I mean, we love the own the topic concept. That's definitely something we're really pushing with, I guess, just a couple pieces to add to that where um, identifying the right segments, make sure you do have enough content. I think one of the challenges we see is clients go in and they, they're pulling on some of these groups that don't necessarily have enough page views enough audience members, uh, and make sure you're working with those blue, uh, blue chip companies. This is a premium thing, like Rick was talking about, it takes time, takes energy. Don't go to your low cost advertisers. Start with the blue chip ones, the tier one uh, uh, prospects, clients, advertisers, things like that, um, and price it accordingly. Don't be afraid of it being a premium product. Our clients love this. And uh, be because it is that recurring subscription model, you don't need to go out and resell it. You're getting new people that are flowing into and out of this as well. Uh, we've got a nice PDF that we're going to share um, afterwards. Um, it just has a, a couple more of these at a very high level. Obviously, we always love to talk about this stuff too, so don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and we're going to talk a ton about this too. Uh, we have our annual uh, industry conference uh, coming up May 4th through 6th in downtown Chicago. You will see some of these friendly faces as well as some of the folks that are also on here that didn't uh, feel like turning on their uh, camera today. 
Um, it's turned into the largest event in the industry. Uh, we are expecting about 350 or so people uh, to show up this year from a variety of different uh, media companies and publishers, B2B, B2C, um, uh, associations, nonprofits, all that kind of stuff. Really good for all levels up and down your organization, C-level, um, audience people, uh, data, tech, sales and revenue. We're going to have five great uh, panels uh, throughout the show. We're going to do a bunch of success stories. We have two really good industry speakers who are coming up. Jacob Donnelly from uh, a media operator and the, and the uh, GM at Morning Brew. He's actually going to record one of his podcast episodes live from the stage. We also have a, a gentleman from Proofpoint. Uh, he runs the deliverability team uh, on the email side of things. So for any clients who have been trying to figure out why their own emails aren't getting through uh, in terms of like their own corporate servers, feel free to come and throw stuff at, at uh, this guy, Jaron. Really great, really knows his stuff on the deliverability side of things. We're going to have some round tables, some great Ask the Expert sessions, uh, and we're going to throw a couple of really good parties too. So omedia.com slash OX5. Um, would love to see uh, see everybody there. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was the ultra fast version. Tony, you crushed it. Thank <laughs> you. You are awesome. And thanks for the follow-up insights and tips too. Um, I wish we had more time to answer a whole bunch of follow-up questions. I think we're okay to stay on for an extra few minutes if anyone does have burning questions, but Vesna, Rick, Tony, thank you. Thank you so much for making this an amazing conversation. You guys did a great job. Such amazing content. Thank you so much. Anybody wants to throw a question in the chat? You know, Jess, we're fine to stay on for a few minutes. Um, I'm blown away by the level of depth and what you shared. I'm so thankful. Anybody, please, you can turn, just turn your mic on and start asking questions. More than happy to have it. Um, and while somebody's doing that or not, I want to remind everybody that after Tony's OX5 is MACMA Day. So we will be live in person in Newark. Um, the information is going to come out shortly. There will also be the virtual uh, aspect registration for anybody who can't fly to Newark. So you're all invited. We can't wait to, to hold this event for all aspects of the industry. And um, I think... It looks like there's not a lot of questions right now. Anybody else? Okay. Besna, thank you. Tony, thank you so much. Rick, thank you. Dennis, you did a phenomenal job. Thank you all for being here. Um, and we will see you uh, April 7th, Ruth Stevens. Amazing B2B conversation. You guys need to be there for that as well. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody.